when a young bicyclist is hit by a car. He fears the worst. I mean, he can't get much worse than that, right? But he fears the worst. He's afraid that he's dead. And he does die. Or does he? I mean, obviously he's still alive if there's some sort of story attached to it. But where did he go when he died? It's a pretty crazy, pretty crazy near-death experience. And then we travel to Florida to take a look at a murder mystery that has many moving pieces. When the police get a phone call that a man has been sitting in a lawn chair for the past two days, not even moving when a thunderstorm rolled in, they have no idea they're about to uncover a grisly web of murder and madness. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys have some awesome plans for the weekend. I can't believe I haven't mentioned this yet. I I am so stoked about the movie Smile. I'm going to go see it opening night. I cannot wait. How did I forget to just talk about that every single episode this week? That movie looks dope. I'm going to put the trailer in the show notes. I cannot wait. I also couldn't wait to see Barbarian and how that turned out. Ugh. I'm still thinking about doing a movie review. <laughs> Barbarian was so ridiculous. Great directing, great writing, amazing acting. Like, everything worked. And then the monster showed up. It was so dumb. Do you guys know anything about Barbarian? I'll pause and wait for you all to answer. Wait for you to email. It's, oh, man. Ugh, so, what? Like, at the ending, I was like, huh, that's it? Anyways, we'll talk about that some other time. Maybe I'll just include something at the end of this episode. I, I almost get it, have to get it off my chest, my feelings about Barbarian. But I can't wait for Smile. I cannot wait for that movie. Someone else who I can't wait for, but I made him wait that long to get his name mentioned walking into Dead Rabbit Command right now, is one of our legacy Patreon supporters, longtime supporter of the show. Give it up for Jonathan Vaca. Yeah, woohoo! Come on in, Jonathan. He's walking in with a big smile on his face. Have you guys seen that? The reviews I've seen for Smile, I'm not pushing Jonathan out of the way. It's like, I want to talk more about Smile. I love you, dude, but... So the thing, I've read the reviews for Smile, and the reviews that I've seen are the trailer lives up to the movie, because the trailer is so good. It's almost like its own little short horror movie. Like, the trailer alone works. Like, the music works, and the mystery works, and the creepiness works. Can't wait to see it. Okay, come back over here, Jonathan. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to push you out of the way, the guy who pays me money. Jonathan, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, I totally understand. Just help spread the word about the show. That really, really helps out a lot. Jonathan, he's he's not smiling. <laughs> he's still upset that I pushed him out of the way. Jonathan, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the hair hydrofoil. That might be a vehicle. I might have just made it up. I don't remember. Let's zoom on out of Dead Rabbit Command. We're headed all the way out to Chile. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we haven't used the hair hydrofoil before. I was like, what sound does a hydrofoil make? I didn't even know hydrofoils existed until a toy, a G.I. Joe toy came out of one. <laughs> We're t- driving on out there. Jonathan is the best captain in the world. We're headed out to Santiago, Chile. It's May 1st, 1982. A sunny spring afternoon. J.F., is the name that this guy goes by, probably like an anonymous report, right? We're going to go ahead and call him Jacob. So Jacob and one of his friends, they're riding their bikes through town when a car comes out of nowhere and smashes into both of these kids. Whoa! They're flying in the air. According to this report, you know, generally when we read a report about about near-death experiences... I don't know. I don't know much about physics, but when you start off with something that sounds like an exaggeration, it does make you go, eh. According to Jacob, when the car hit his bike, he flew 150 feet in the air. Not, not straight up, which would be pretty fun, but like latitudinally, if that's a word, I'm not for sure. He flies away. He flies. <laughs> I'm trying. You're like Jason. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. You meant like he flew. You now even you can't figure out the word. What would be the word? If when you hit a baseball and it flies in a straight line, that's the word I was looking for. He flew in a straight line, 150 feet. 
That sounds like an exaggeration. I don't know how fast this car was going, but apparently he's like, whoa, and he's like flying 150 feet. And he actually, this is a very, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge type moment. So as he's flying through the air, Jacob has a thought in his head. Jacob realizes he's in no pain. He's feeling absolutely no pain as he is moving at such a high velocity towards who knows what, right? A tree stump, another car, another car driving the opposite direction. He starts getting ping-ponged back and forth. What he realizes, he's not feeling any pain as he's flying through the air. He also realizes that he's no longer in his body. It's now Jacob's soul flying through the air. Whoa. And while his soul is removed from his body, all of a sudden this light seems to shine from somewhere. And these two figures appear. The next thing he knows, he's standing in an illuminated room. What? Where am I? I thought I was just about to get smashed into all of this stuff. I thought I was going to play pinball with my own body. He's standing in this room, this illuminated room. When he looks down at the floor, he sees Earth. Now, not like he looks down. I said that wrong. I'm, <laughs> I'm really striking out on the story. You're like, Jason, I can do that. When I look down, I see Earth. No. He looks down at the floor, and he sees the planet Earth. Like he's in a UFO. You're like, whoa, I, that's not what I expected. Yeah, he's in a UFO. And he realizes that he can look down, and he can see Earth. His body, his physical form is somewhere still on the planet. He's simply a being made out of nothing but light. And the two beings, the two figures that he saw earlier, put him on a stretcher. And he immediately begins to feel heat all over his body. They then begin to do something. He doesn't really have a description for what they did, but he said they begin to do something to my head. And he realized, they didn't say this, but he realized that what they were doing was necessary for him to stay alive. So this is really interesting. He's not in his physical form anymore. He knows he's not in his physical form, but he has some sort of humanoid form in this being of light. He's nothing but pure light. And he still has arms and legs and a head, and he can still identify them. And even though his body is somewhere on Earth, as they're manipulating things in his soul, right, as they're working on his soul, it is healing his physical form. That's kind of what he's seeing. That's kind of what he's sensing, that they have to do this for him to stay alive. He is then taken from this illuminated room to a city. Not a city on Earth, but some sort of alien landscape. And he's wearing pajamas now. He's walking his little... <laughs> it's the little prince. He's walking around. He's like, oh, man. I thought the afterlife was going to be way cooler. No, I'm just a little prince. He's walking around in pajamas. I'm assuming he's still made of nothing but light at this point. But he has, like, Denver the Dinosaur pajamas. He's walking around in these pajamas. And he's walking through the city. And he's taken to this thing he describes as a large object. And it almost seems to be different from the rest of the city. Like, he can identify it as something different. So this might be another vessel, another UFO-type craft. He's brought aboard this object, this vessel, and there he sees other people, other humans. And he describes them as they're all in various states of dying. Some are near death. Some are just starting the process of dying. I don't know if there's any, like, decayed people laying there. But various states of dying. And then he's taken out of there, out of this vessel. <laughs> That's a great part of your tour, right? They're like, hey, would you like to see the dying human exhibit? You're like, no, I don't want to go see that at all. He's then taken out of that object, out of that place, to another city full of dinosaurs. <laughs> Let me explain that a little better. I love that visual. They weren't they weren't actual dinosaurs. You're all excited. You're like, woohoo, in the afterlife I get a ride of brontosaurus and slide down its neck. 
I paused at just the right part. He saw dinosaur-like animals. So they're like, they're like knockoff dollar store dinosaurs. It's like the Triceratops, but the horns are in the wrong place. He has four of them, which would still be pretty dope, right? <laughs> you went somewhere and you saw like a derpy T-Rex. It's still a T-Rex. You're like, well, those arms are too long. That's not a T-Rex. And its eyes look wobbly. It's still a dinosaur. Who cares if it's dinosaur adjacent? It's still super dope. But I also left off another keyword. <laughs> what did you be excited? This show's falling apart. Man, we, we just have to admit it at a certain point. This show's become a circuit side show. This podcast, I love it. It's hilarious. But anyways, I'm like pausing at certain moments to get your hopes up. I'm like, hee hee He goes to this place of dinosaur knockoffs. They're dinosaur-like animals, and they're tiny. They're like the size of domesticated animals. So you would see like a T-Rex, but it would be, say, the size of a horse. And a Triceratops would be the size of a cat. He doesn't give the exact specifications. Which, sure, that's not as cool as like a giant brontosaurus. But I would be digging a brontosaurus like the size of a camel. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, don't try sliding down its neck. It probably can't support your weight there. But you can still ride it around. You can still, you know, wrestle with a T-Rex. Do that stuff. He can't. They don't, <laughs> they don't let him have any fun. It's off to the next exhibit. He sees all these domesticated dinosaur-like creatures walking around this town. And the the beans, these beans, who I think I think at this point would be fair to say they're alien, they this is so fascinating to me. They tell him it's not his time to die. He actually has, like thousands of other earthlings, a mission to complete. You have to go back to Earth, and you have to complete this mission. But they don't really tell him what the mission is. They just say there's he has a purpose on Earth. They put an implant in his brain. They begin to tell him things like, We have bases all over Earth. Yeah, so it's clearly alien at this point, right? They have bases all over Earth. Like, the alien presence on Earth is real, and they're pretty well established on the planet. And then another really interesting thing happens. So, because we've covered a lot of near-death experiences on this, and I always try to find the weirdest of the weird. They put an implant in his head, and he begins to bilocate. He begins to appear in two places at once. Now, not like he's on one side of the room and he's waving at himself on the other side of the room. He specifically says, so when they put that implant in my brain and they are still talking to me, all of a sudden I'm in different places all at the same time. He goes, I was standing in the middle of Africa, and at the same time I was in the Pleiades star system. The next thing Jacob knows, he's back in his body on Earth, his physical form, and both him and his friend fully recovered from the accident. It's an interesting story. I got it from one of my favorite resources on this show, thingaboutadocs.com. They got it from a group known as the Federation of UFO Logical, UFO Logical Research of Chile. And the head researcher of this particular story was Juan Gilmero Aguilera Rodriguez. It's a fascinating look at near-death experience, right? It's not just him dying and his soul leaving his body. We have alien involvement. We have dinosaurs, right? The dinosaurs are really dope. And this idea, this bilocation thing, which is, I mean, like, really, this is where you get into a lot of mysticism. This is where you even move past paranormal into a lot of mystical thinking. How big is the universe, really? Like, at a, we can look at these huge distances and go, well, that's 50 light years away. We would have to travel at the speed of light. For 50 years to get there, and we can't travel at the speed of light. Nothing can travel at the speed of light, so we can only travel near the speed of light, which is a huge difference. Speed of light, near speed of light, there's a huge gulf there, so this is so far away. But when you look at the metaphysics, when you look at this, if you they've they've done experiments on this. I mean, the, the science, some people say the science is real dodgy on this, but you can take an atom... And you can have it in two locations at the same time. And when you manipulate it here, it will register that it's being lit up over here. Like, they'll both light up at the same time because it's the same atom in two different places. 
And if you grabbed one atom, you're actually it, there. It, it's not two atoms. It's one. It's one thing, but you can actually see it in two different places. How is that even possible? And if you let's say that one appeared to be on the left side of the room and one appeared to be on the right side of the room, if you grab the one on the right side of the room, it's the same one. You could pick it up and you'd pick up, quote unquote, both of them. So we've looked at stuff like this just as a metaphysical community. I don't know if we really talked about it on the show so much. So the question is, if all of matter came out of a singular point, i.e. the Big Bang type of event, then everything is connected. There's no difference between me and an asteroid flying through deep space right now. Like, technically, there's a bunch of people shaking their heads right now. They're like, okay, that's not what the metaphysical theory is saying, bro. Like, you need to re- We're all from the same. There is no distance. There's zero distance whatsoever. And that would explain a lot of stuff, like, with aliens flying around the universe. Like, I honestly think when we discover the secret of alien technology when we i don't think the universe is i think it's as big as we register it as i do think it's x many miles millions of miles wide or billions or whatever but it's not that far i don't i I think it's that big but it's not that far if that makes sense like you have to think two things are kind of true at the same time once we realize the aliens aren't getting a ship and being like it's 50 light years away guys we're say goodbye to our families we'll never see them again they get here incredibly fast once we realize whether they're creating their own wormholes or they're bending time space or they're staying in one location and moving the universe around them whatever theory you want to have when we figure it out, we're going to be like, I can't, but that's so simple. It's the simplest thing. I think the same way when we have air flight now, when we figured out planes, we go, oh, yeah, no, we can mass produce planes. It took humanity thousands of years to get to a workable airplane. And now you can build one with the right tools in your backyard because it's so simple. When you think of the science behind it, it's so simple. You know what I mean? Like, once we figure out the science, it will be rote. It'll just be something that's done. And I, I do, th- I am a, like a fan of the idea that the universe is folded up in such a way that I can look and see something really far away, but really I can be in both places at the same time. I may be in both places in the same time right now. I don't know. It's trippy. It's trippy. Like, what is time? What is space? What are all of these things? And this guy dies, really. His soul leaves his body, and the aliens fix them. And it's interesting. It's a good parallel to yesterday's story, right? Where I said that aliens were a bunch of jerks who are walking into the mentally disabled households and walking into elderly care centers and stuff like that and abducting people who wouldn't remember it anyways. I kind of painted them as this horrible jerk race, which they very well could be. They do do a lot of bad stuff, but... I thought this was an interesting story in contrast to that. Like, the aliens did heal him, right? That was kind of what I was saying yesterday. How come the aliens, if they're abducting these people who have physical disabilities, how come they aren't healing those disabilities? It's interesting. It's a whole interesting phenomenon, why they do what they do and how they do it. And do they exist, right? Is it alien? Is it interdimensional? Is it angelic or demonic or something that we can't even put a word to? Are there dinosaurs? Are there dinosaurs? All of this stuff, fascinating story, blending the near-death experience with the alien reality. Absolutely fascinating. I'm glad I could share it with you. Jonathan, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the Carboner Copter. We're leaving behind Santiago, Chile. We're going to hit a couple bicyclists. We're like, don't worry, you guys will have a fun experiment in space. As we're bumping into them and taking off, we're leaving behind Santiago, Chile. Take us all the way out to South Dade County, Florida. It's July 21st, 1973, and we're in South Dade County, Florida. And there's a man known as Albert Burst, 44-year-old building inspector, sitting outside in his backyard. Got his little lawn chair propped up, sitting down, comfortably enjoying another hot swampy Florida summer day. But his next door neighbor, she's taking the laundry off the line. And she looks over and she sees Albert just sitting in the chair, you know, just relaxing. 
But when a thunderstorm starts to roll in, begins to rain, she notices that Albert's still just sitting in that chair. Not moving, not even flinching, as the rain splatters against his face. She mentions it to her son. She's like, Albert next door, he's just sitting there. It's raining. It's it's weird. And her son goes, yeah, it is weird. He actually has been sitting back there for two days straight now. What? Yeah, yeah, he's been back there for two days. I probably should have told you something at least a day ago. He's been sitting out there for two days straight. Look back over the fence, and there's Albert just sitting there. Rain pouring down on him. The neighbor calls the police and says, I think there's a dead man in the garden next door. I think you need to come take a look. Let's go back a week earlier. And we're going to meet a young woman named Mary Ellen Jones. She's 15 years old. She's hitchhiking through Florida with her boyfriend, Mark Matson. And I use the word boyfriend, I mean, it's technically true, but they had just met the day before. This was a whirlwind romance, if there ever has been one. They met each other on a beach, and now they're hitchhiking together through Florida, ready to start life together, or maybe just have a good time. And as they're hitchhiking down the road, a car pulls up. There's a middle-aged man driving it. His name is Eric. He's more than willing to pick up this young couple and take them to where they want to go. He ended up taking the young couple back to his house, and it does seem like this was all consensual. This was part of the plan. It would be a nice place to stay the night, and then they would continue the journey the next day. But when Eric gets this young couple to his home, he pulls a gun out. At gunpoint, he's pointing it at Mark pointing it at Mary, back to Mark, threatening these two young people. He forces them to take their clothes off and then forces them to have sex with each other. And as he's sitting there watching this young couple have sex, he has another part of his plan. He goes and gets a camera. And while holding the gun, he tries to steady the camera and begins to snap photos of these young people having sex. But he just can't get it right. That would be very difficult to try to hold a gun and use one of those old 1970s cameras at the same time. So he puts the gun down. He's so caught up in the fantasy of what's going on, the fantasy that he's made a reality. He puts the gun down. And with both hands begins snapping these photos that he's going to save for later. Mark sees the gun has been placed down and makes a move for it. But Eric is faster. He grabs the gun and shoots Mark three times, killing him right in front of Mary. Eric then grabs Mary and forces her down the hallway towards his bedroom. Inside Eric's bedroom, there's a hidden door that, when opened, reveals a soundproof room with arm shackles on the wall. Eric takes Mary into this room, shackles her to the wall, and for the next 24 hours, keeps her as a sex slave in his soundproof room in this seemingly normal-looking suburban home. But after 24 hours pass, Eric undoes the shackles and tells Mary, I'm going to let you go on the condition that you don't tell anybody about what happened here. Can you do that for me? Mary, of course, says yes, and is let go. She's shocked, right? She'd watched this man already kill Mark. She feared the worst. She endured the worst. She's let go. 
she goes straight to the police. And she tells him this story, and the police are just kind of like, wait, what? Like, I mean, I guess that's possible. I mean, we are police. We do see horrible things, but they don't know whether or not to believe her. Really, they just have this 15-year-old girl running into their police office telling this outlandish story. A guy makes you two have sex, and he's taking photos of it. And... So they call up her mom. Her mom in Kentucky. They call up her mom and they go, hey, we have your daughter here. We think she ran away and she's telling us this story. And the mom goes, stop, just stop right there. Listen, my daughter's a pathological liar. Whatever story she's telling you isn't true. Glad you got my daughter. I'll send down money for a bus ticket and send her back up. But So the police send Mary off to her mom. And they figure... It's just all made up. It's a pathological liar making up this insane story. On July 21st, the police are called to the home of Albert Burst. And sure enough, he's been sitting in his backyard, dead, for two days. So they call in a meat wagon. I don't think that's the technical term for him. They're going to take him down to have an autopsy done to figure out what it could be. 44 is really too young for a heart attack, right? He looks... Relatively healthy. Send him down, figure out what it could have been. And as he's headed down to the coroner, the police go into his house. See if they can uncover anything there that could have led to his death. And once they enter the house, the first thing they smell is the overwhelming stench of rotten meat. They follow the smell to the bathroom. When they walk into the bathroom, they notice that one of the bathroom walls appears to be bleeding. So (laughs) they're not spooky. They're not scared of ghosts, right? They don't think they're spooky, spooky ghosts. Maybe one or two of them did. They go, let's cut into this wall because we can smell rotten meat. We got a dead man out there. There's probably a dead man behind this wall. So they actually have to piece by piece break down this cement slab that has been placed in this bathroom wall. And as they're breaking it, the smell becomes even more overpowering. And they're finally able to get a good grip and tear a chunk of it away. And inside the wall is the headless, handless, footless corpse of Mark Matson. And although they don't immediately recognize this as Mark Madsen, because they don't know what he looks like, they start to think about that story that young girl told them just a week ago about a man who took them to a house in the suburbs of Miami and shot somebody and then raped her. They decide to go check out the bedroom of Eric, who they are very quickly putting together, was not a real name. Eric actually was Albert Burst. And when they go into Albert's bedroom, they do find the soundproof sex room. They now know that the girl's story was true. They now know that Albert was Eric and Albert is a murderer. The question is, who killed Albert? Albert Burst didn't have many friends, but the people that he did know regarded him as an extremely smart individual. He just was very intolerant of other people, of of pretty much everything. He hated his way through life. He had a criminal record from when he was much younger. He spent some time in jail. And he just kind of floated through life, right? But he was angry at it. And he kept a journal. He wrote down his thoughts, his fears, his desires. This is so fascinating. Let's take a look at some of these quotes from this journal. He wrote, quote, rape, murder, suicide. These thoughts are constantly with me. Of course, this is not mentally healthy. There is no doubt that by present standards, I am mentally ill, a hopeless sociopath. He craved the companionship of a woman, but he couldn't see himself on equal footing with a woman. 
He didn't want someone around where they could sit and talk, someone they could go on walks with, someone that he could argue with. Where are we going to go to dinner? What are we going to watch tonight? That wasn't his goal. He didn't want a woman. He wanted a woman. She had to be controlled by him. She had to be willing to be a slave to him. But he couldn't find any woman willing and taking up that offer. He states that at the age of 44, he was still a virgin. He had lived his entire life not being able to have what he wanted more than anything. He wrote in his journal, quote, After work, I always get home as soon as possible to enjoy my solitary sanctuary and its music and books and TV. No sex yet, but I'm working on it. Slowly, with determined resolve. I know what I want. I need someone for sex. Yes. But not an idiot I have to cater to. Enter the Brustian solution. The Brustian solution, named after Albert Brust, if I've mispronounced it a couple times, I apologize. You're Googling Albert Burst. You're Googling Albert Burst. You're like, what a fantastic story. Who is this guy? <laughs> this guy doesn't exist. Albert Brust. I'll try to go in and edit those up or clean it up a bit. But Albert <laughs> Albert Burst. I'm glad I can have such a good belly laugh during this otherwise terrifying story. Albert Brust is the author of The Brustian Solution, and The Brustian Solution was to kidnap a woman and to lock her in his sex slave torture room. What is so fascinating about this story is this is something he longed for for years. He was obsessed with murder. He was obsessed with kidnapping a woman and making her his slave. This was what he wanted. He didn't want someone he had to cater to. He didn't want a woman he would have to talk to or do anything else with. He just wanted a slave. And when he finally got it, he snatched that woman off the street, dragged her to the bedroom, and owned her as a slave. He wrote in his journal, I have miscalculated. He was disappointed. After all that time, after finally getting what he wanted, who he wanted, where he wanted, he was disappointed. It just didn't live up to his fantasies. After decades of loneliness, after decades of dreaming of this moment, it still didn't fill that hole inside of him. That's why he let her go. I have miscalculated, he wrote. And then he begins writing about, you know, I could probably take Mark's body out of the bathroom wall. It's not a proper place to dispose of a body. It's super stinky. I have to go into the bathroom. He starts talking about, you know, maybe if I move Mark's body out of the concrete and bury it in the backyard, so it'll be more disguised and I don't have to smell and all that stuff. But then he writes, quote, But I see no good reason for going on. What would come next? The whole business... Is not worth it. Life is not worth the trouble after all. After finally achieving his fantasy and it didn't live up to what he thought it would be, life is not worth the trouble after all. So Albert Brust poured himself a big glass of chocolate milk, added a little bit of cyanide, walked out to the yard, sat down in his lawn chair, 
Underneath the warm summer sky, he drank that glass of chocolate milk and sat motionless in that chair for two days until the thunderstorm rolled in. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. 